This talk should be called Coronaviruses Laid Bare, which is kind of appropriate given that I run the Naked Scientists. I'm not naked today. I'm sorry if anyone's turned up expecting a display of nudity and you're now disappointed. You would actually be a lot more disappointed, I would hasten to add, if I was actually naked. But what are we going to cover today? Well, I'm going to speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, and it's your opportunity to ask any questions that have occurred to you either before you join this session or as I'm speaking about coronaviruses, COVID-19 and what the future looks like. Now first of all, what actually is COVID-19 and where did this thing come from? That's what I'm going to cover. I'm going to tell you how it spreads and I don't just mean spreads from one person to the next, we're also going to cover across borders because this has become an international problem. Then I'm also going to touch on actually how we're trying to keep tabs on it. How are we trying to understand this virus in terms of where it's going, how it's causing disease, who it's spreading to, and how we can try to keep it under control? And speaking of control, I'll then try and cover some aspects of what researchers around the world are investigating by way of either therapies, drugs and so on, or vaccines to prevent it, and some of the other measures, such as public health measures that can stop it. So that's all the scope for you to ask questions about when we get there. Well, first of all, what actually is this thing? What is COVID-19? Well, this is a coronavirus, as the name suggests, and as many people are now familiar. And this family of viruses are actually relative newcomers. We didn't really know about them until the 1960s. And this is thanks to a lady called June Almeida, who was working at St. Thomas's Medical School in London. She was an expert electron microscopist. And she spotted these particles in people who had the symptoms of the common cold down a microscope and initially people said that they were some kind of mutated flu virus and they didn't believe her but together with David Tyrrell the two of them then published unarguably excellent pictures of these coronaviruses and a new family of viruses were born that we now understand a lot more about so this is a big family of viruses the coronaviruses and humans succumb to just a handful of, of viruses that fall within that family but lots of other animals catch them too. And they include birds and chickens classically, but also bats. And this is interesting because this gives us some kind of clue about where this new coronavirus, which doesn't look like any of the other coronaviruses, it's genetically distinct, it's a brand new coronavirus, uh, where it's actually come from. Now, when I say it doesn't look like any of them, what I mean by that is it is clearly a new entity. We've never seen this in humans before. And we can get some clues by actually looking at the genetics of the virus. We can read through the genome. The virus is about 30,000 genetic letters long. And by reading through it, we can compare it to other members of the coronavirus family. And what that tells us is that this new coronavirus is similar in about 80% of its genetic information to SARS. And if you cast your mind back to 2002 to 2003, that was the what was then thought to be potentially a major pandemic in the offing when a new virus emerged from China and spread around the world. It caused 5,000 plus cases and more than 500 people died of a severe acute respiratory syndrome, which is where the name came from. Because this new virus is so similar to that SARS in terms of having 80% of its DNA, sorry, its genetic information, it's an RNA virus, the same. As a result, it got dubbed SARS. CoV-2, SARS coronavirus 2. It's like Terminator 2 following Terminator 1, the movie. And where it came from? Well, that's an interesting question, isn't it? Because everyone agrees that the first cases of this were reported in China and specifically in Wuhan City in China and in one market in one corner of Wuhan City. And that market was a fish market. But it also had an under-the-counter trade in various other rare species and other animal products. And at the moment, people are speculating, we don't know for sure, but people are speculating that the virus came from that market and was caused by an infectious consignment of bats and that along with the bats were another consignment of an illegal species that shouldn't have been traded in the market called pangolins. If you haven't seen a pangolin, you can look them up on Wikipedia. They're a scaly mammal and they're incredibly cute and they break, break down into an African variety and an Asian variety. And 
they walk around a bit like mini dinosaurs actually they're very very fascinating to watch but they are a delicacy in many east asian cuisines and so they're illegally traded across east asia and there's a thriving trade in china as well people pay a lot of money to to eat them and what we think may have happened is that a consignment of bats brought into the market was placed very close to a consignment of pangolins in the market and a virus from bats a bat coronavirus mixed up or in some way transferred genetic information from a pangolin and this created a hybrid virus which is SARS-CoV-2. It needed the pangolin to be there because this virus on the outside has a series of what are called spikes and these spikes are sticky they're like viral velcro it's how the virus gets into our cells and this particular new coronavirus is very good at gluing itself onto a structure called ACE2, which is angiotensin converting enzyme receptor 2, which is found on the surface, sorry, angiotensin converting enzyme 2, which is found on the surface of various cells in various organs in the body. But that structure comes from the pangolin, but the rest of the virus is bat. So we think, and this is the best theory so far, that it's 96% bat with a handful of pangolin genetic information thrown into the mix and that has created this hybrid. That's our current theory. But people are saying, well, there is a very big virology institute in Wuhan. Could it possibly be that this is an accidental release from a laboratory? And although there's no evidence at the moment directly to corroborate this, people are calling for an investigation. Julia Gillard, who's the Prime Minister, former Prime Minister of Australia, has taken up a position at the Wellcome Trust. She's going to lead the Wellcome Trust next year and one of her priorities, she has said, is to lead an international investigation into where this came from. Not in order to point the, the finger, but in order for us to learn important lessons about how this happens and how to stop it happening again. The reason people are worried about that is that if you look at the original SARS, SARS from 2002 to 2003, it's almost identical how that emerged. An infectious consignment of bats, horseshoe bats in this case, were brought to a market they were placed next to a consignment of civet cats. The civet cats don't naturally catch SARS, but the bats gave it to them. The civet cats became very, very sick very, very quickly and therefore very infectious. And people who bought them or interacted with them then contracted SARS, the original virus. So it looks like these markets in China and bringing species together under unnatural circumstances and placing them in high density, very close together is the perfect recipe for how to spawn new infections and new viruses. And when we're talking about emerging infections like the new SARS coronavirus, then 75% uh, of the time, the source of these new and emerging infections is a wild animal. So this is something we have to be very cautious about with a view to the future. Now, the Chinese have told us that they first began to detect this virus in November, 2019. And uh, bizarrely, they somehow managed to isolate the virus in record time and then publish the genetic information of the virus by the beginning of January, which is when they notified the World Health Organization that they may have a problem. Actually, subsequent to this, Harvard University, about a week or two ago, published some interesting satellite data showing hospitals in Wuhan and how much traffic they were receiving. And in the month before the Chinese alleged that there were the first cases of this new coronavirus, there was a very, very dramatic surge in usage of hospitals. The car parks, which were in these satellite pictures from the Harvard team, uh, are absolutely full in these hospitals and uh, nothing has been suggested to account for why a month before we're being told the virus emerged, these hospitals should be packed with people. Uh, and that so far remains an unanswered question. But if we assume that uh, November was the origin and that the market in question was the source place, indeed uh, samples have been taken from that market and it's possible to show that there was quite widespread infection in the market. You can recover virus and traces of the virus from various places in the market. What we assume happened is that humans in that market, both staff and also visitors to the market, contracted this new coronavirus. And they then went home to their various places around the city and started the incubation period. Now, the incubation period for this new coronavirus is quite long. Unlike most acute respiratory infections, which have an incubation which is normally up to about five days, 
The new coronavirus is nearly three times that long in some cases. It ranges between one day to as long as 14 days. The average is about five days. And a bizarre illness then ensues. People initially just feel a bit rough for a week or so, and they may develop a cough. And one of the defining symptoms is a new cough. And on top of the new cough, people often become feverish and they often also lose their sense of smell and taste. And we now understand why they lose their sense of smell and taste. And the reason for that is because the virus targets preferentially cells in the nose and throat, which are concerned with your sense of smell. And they have a very rich representation on those cells of the receptor that the virus hits when it wants to infect a cell in the first place, which probably accounts for that. Now, when those people then get the symptoms and they become infectious, they can pass the virus on to other people. And as far as we can tell, it's very infectious. The R value, the reproduction number for this virus, which is a measure of for every case you've got, how many new cases does each case cause, is pretty high. It's somewhere between three and four. And to give you a comparison for the general seasonal flu that we encounter in wintertime, that number's more like one and a half. Swine flu in 2009 was about one and a half. So this is potentially two or three times more infectious and spreadable than your average winter flu. So potentially quite a big threat. Those people therefore began to spread this infection to a large number of other people, but they didn't know what was wrong with them. And that is if they had any symptoms at all. And therein lies the other problem because about half of cases may have no symptoms whatsoever. So half the time there were people coming and going and potentially spreading the virus around and traveling critically internationally, and we knew nothing about it. But then people began to get dramatically unwell. And this is after about a week of feeling not good and having a cough, a fever, loss of sense of smell and taste. People then began to get more severe symptoms. They began to struggle to breathe and a number ended up admitted to hospital and were given supplemental oxygen. Some of them then deteriorated further and needed more oxygen or may even have needed ventilation in intensive care. And more beyond that, subsequently deteriorated to an extent that they then passed away. And this is the point at which I think alarm bells began to ring because a new group of people began to present with these very dramatic symptoms simultaneously. And this was testing negative against all the other things we normally look for that can cause these sorts of symptoms. So scientists and researchers and doctors would have known something was definitely up. And at that point, samples were collected from people and they managed to grow and then sequence the genetic code of this new coronavirus. Now, here's the rub. The airport in Wuhan had about three or four thousand people per day leaving that airport and flying internationally to destinations, uh, including Heathrow. Now, Heathrow is one of the world's busiest airports and it's next door to one of the world's busiest cities. And that's London. And so when people say, why did we get so many cases in the UK and why were we so hard hit? And the numbers really do speak for themselves. That's the reason, because we had a lot of people flying in from affected parts of the world through Heathrow and then they were jumping on the train and heading straight for central London and of course under London is London underground and that's moving something in the region of three million people per day under normal circumstances that's a third of the population of Sweden and more than the population of New Zealand so you can see that under these sorts of circumstances it's a perfect catalyst for spreading diseases around. So let's just recap for a second. We have this new disease which emerges in November and begins to infect large numbers of people across November and December with a relatively long incubation period, making it hard to track who's giving it to who. And half the time, perhaps, people have no symptoms at all. Pretty quickly, we've got a big outbreak in China and the world are told at the beginning of January. And by then, probably hundreds, if not thousands of cases have already left the area where the disease began and traveled internationally and seeded infections in many different jurisdictions all over the world. Now, why are these people becoming so unwell? Why are they getting so severe uh, symptoms? Now, this has been a mystery because when we look at the time course, by the time people become really, really unwell, actually the amount of virus they're producing is relatively low or going down or even undetectable, but the disease carries on. So what we think is happening is the disease falls into two phases. 
the viral phase when the initial attack happens on your body by the virus and then an immune phase where the virus drives your immune system into a sort of overdrive state, a so-called cytokine storm. And that then leads to onward damage to other tissues in the body, including damage to the lungs, but it can also cause damage to the kidneys, damage to the heart, damage to the liver, and it can also get into the nervous system as well. There's evidence it may also affect the way that blood clots and it provokes all kinds of strange changes in the immune system, which may produce long-term effects. We're seeing a large number of patients now with symptoms very similar to what we call chronic fatigue syndrome. We know that in a proportion of those patients, there is an immune cause for that. So it would appear that it's provoking some kind of chronic fatigue state. So how are we keeping tabs on this? Well, when this first began to happen, we realized we needed a screening program and we needed one quickly. And luckily, because we had the genetic code for the virus, we were able to find a region of that code within the part of the virus genome where it codes for the machinery that copies the virus genetic information. And that is unique and specific for this new coronavirus. And we were able to use that as a sensitive test to look for people who had the infection. And the way the test works is that we're collecting swabs from people's noses and throats where the virus preferentially lands and begins to grow to start with. And that sample is then sent to a laboratory like the one that I helped to run. And we extract the genetic information from the virus from the sample and copy it millions of times. And having copied it millions of times, we're then able to read it and see if there are samples in there corresponding to the new coronavirus. And if there are, and we can detect as few as eight copies of the virus genome in each sample. So it's very sensitive when it works. And that will tell us whether or not someone is actively infected with the virus. The other kinds of testing that are coming along now are antibody tests. These are so-called serological tests. And these are going to be important because if you come to us and you say, I had these symptoms six weeks ago, we don't actually know if you've really had the virus or not just by doing a test because after about 14 days, you will test negative. We won't recover any virus from you. But the virus leaves an immune legacy behind. And that means if we look in the bloodstream, we can find antibodies, which are the result of you having reacted against and fought off the coronavirus. And so now there are antibody tests coming along that can look for antibodies that you make when you recover from the infection. So we can do an antibody test now to tell who is immune. In other words, who's just had coronavirus and who is yet to be infected. The numbers for the UK at the moment suggest that about 95% of the population have not had coronavirus. So only about 5% of people with some hot spots and some cold spots around the country, but 5% on average have had the infection. And this is why there is a worry that if we de-escalate our lockdown too quickly, then the virus will be back with a vengeance because there's a massive population who are still available and could still catch it. The other way that we're keeping tabs on this is with good old fashioned epidemiology, so-called track and trace epidemiology. And the idea behind this is that the way you stamp out an infectious disease is you stop people giving it to other people. I've already mentioned this is a very infectious virus. It spreads to about three or four people for every case that we see. But in some cases, it may be 100. There are some documented uh, examples of, uh, of children, for instance, in a school, giving it to hundreds of other children. There are cases of adults giving it to hundreds of other adults. So it's not a given that it'll be three or four, but it's three or four other people on average. And so what we're able to do is to track down cases of people who have the infection and then follow up aggressively to see who they had contact with during the window during which they may have been infectious and then contact those people and make them isolate. Why does isolating work? Isolating works because when you isolate, you cannot pass the virus on to another person. You are robbing it of its chain of transmission. You can think of it as a bit like a relay race at the now cancelled Olympics when one person's running around and they want to give the baton to a, another runner, the baton is the virus. If you space the runners out too far, then there's no way that they can pass the baton on, the baton is dropped, the chain of transmission is broken. And that's how lockdowns and isolation help to break the chain. So those are the main measures that have been used, as well as basically stopping travel, because travel also helps to ferry viruses around very, very efficiently. That's how we've actually intervened and stopped the chain of transmission. So what does the future hold? Well, at the moment, of course, we're just emerging from this lockdown. We've never in the history and living memory 
uh, been in a situation where people have been robbed of, of what they regard as, as many of their normal freedoms. And we've expected people to stay at home, not go out, not go to work. We think that the UK economy will take a hit to the tune of about three or a third of a trillion, probably, is what this has cost so far. And we haven't even got rid of the problem yet. We're now down to about uh, one in 2,000 people in society actually having the affection at any one time. That's about 0.05%. So very, very low numbers in society having the infection. But we remain a vulnerable society, which is why measures haven't been removed, because otherwise it will come back. So what scientists are now doing is searching aggressively for a vaccine, because at the end of the day, that's probably going to be the only way we can solve this problem. Because if we, have no vac if we don't have a vaccine, we remain uh, vulnerable to infection. Around the world, there are something like 100 different projects going now in many countries about half of the projects are in the US but the rest are not in the US and about half of the projects are commercial ventures the other half are non-commercial but they're exploring about 10 different types of strategy to make different vaccines and this is a gamble and we need a lot of projects doing this because pharmaceutical companies usually estimate that they only succeed when making a new drug or a vaccine about 10 percent of the time so the more irons we have in the fire, the more likely we are to be successful. At the moment, we have only initial evidence about whether these vaccines will even work. We've never made a vaccine against a coronavirus, let alone this new coronavirus. We've never made a vaccine against a coronavirus or any virus in a matter of months, which is what's being asked of our scientists and researchers at the moment. And it's certainly no mean feat to expect to vaccinate something like 8 billion people, which is the Earth population at the moment, which is what we're going to have to comprehensively do if we're going to stamp this thing out. A parallel track alongside vaccines is the development of drugs. In some cases, these are brand new drugs which will actually stop the virus in its tracks and will effectively neutralise the infection once it's got going. They may even be used to prevent a person becoming in infected in the first place. That's very experimental. We don't have anything on the table yet it takes a long time to make new drugs and viruses are notoriously difficult to make antiviral drugs against because they're using our own human cells to grow and therefore trying to find differences between how the virus works and how our cells work, which is what we do to make antibiotics to kill bacterial infections, that just doesn't work. So we're not able to do it in the same way. At the same time, scientists are doing what's called drug repurposing. They're looking for drugs which just by chance are already on the shelves, they're already going into patients, but they have a side effect of neutralizing coronaviruses. And some of these drugs are showing some promise in some trials. And now researchers are doing bigger trials to see if they can find proof of concept. One very good example emerged last week with the recovery trial from the University of Oxford that showed that dexamethasone, a steroid we've had for more than six decades, can, use, can be used in people who have severe coronavirus infection and it may reduce the mortality in that group by up to 30%. At the moment, the search still goes on though to look for new therapies. So in summary, we are in a situation that in living memory, we've never been in before. We have a new virus, which we've known about for just six months, which, which measures just one 10,000th of a millimeter across, has spread to every country pretty much that we know of in the world, has caused something like 9 million cases, has claimed 500,000 lives and has caused Britain as an economy to borrow about one and a half times its GDP, its gross domestic project, product, and we haven't actually solved the, pro the problem yet. I'll leave you with the thoughts of uh, Melinda Gates from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation because she made a very important point, which was to say that if there is COVID anywhere, there is COVID everywhere. In other words, this is a global problem and it's going to need a global solution. It's no good just looking to our own country and solving the problem here, because if we don't solve the problem everywhere, then COVID will just come back. So for now, that's where we are.